This is Caps PA announcer Wes Johnson, and you're listening to Bull the Pod. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of What the Puck. It is a Washington Capitals podcast, which means it's a podcast about your 2018 Stanley Cup champions. Thank you all for listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Player.fm, Overcast, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Facebook, and YouTube. Well, uh, it hasn't been that long since we talked to you, but... Uh, from last show to the show before that, we actually have some games to talk about. It's what? not we're, we're done with the pause. I was wrong. They actually are playing games. They aren't going to wait until January 20th like we saw last time when we were live recording. And we saw the craziness going on with the NHL website. Yeah, it looks like someone just done messed up the website. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Giving me a little bit of a heart attack. Thanks for that, NHL. But here we are. It is a new year. It's 2022. It's the same old caps. They can't get it done in OT. I thought that should have been the New Year's resolution. Win in OT, but the caps... I'd rather their New Year's resolution be improving the power play. Scoring on the power play. Samantha Pell would be very happy if the resolution was no more overtime. That's true. That is very true. But we got a couple games to talk about. Since we talked last, the Caps had three games up against the uh, Nashville Predators, the Detroit Red Wings, and the uh, New Jersey Devils. Did you watch the New Year's Eve game? Yeah. Against Detroit. Uh, That was, you know, uh, because of Omicron and all that kind of stuff, you know, there wasn't a lot of plans to go out, be amongst a big crowd for a ball drop or anything like that. So the New Year's Eve I had was dinner with my girlfriend, then watching the Caps, then watching wrestling, and then watching the ball drop. I mean, you could not have asked for a more Brandon New Year's Eve than I had 2021 (laughs) and 2022, whilst also drinking the Rocks tequila, which was quite smooth. I'll put the, I'll just say that quite smooth. I hope he hears this and then gives me a free bottle. Uh, But what a, what a new year's Eve, what a, a three game stretch. The caps though, we're about mid season at this point. They're having some issues. They're, they're not able to finish games. They're letting teams hang around. Uh, Coach, what have you thought of these last three games? You know, it's been – it's an interesting view as to uh, how this team does because they're still winning for the most part. I mean, they had two wins and a loss, but it was a sloppy loss in New Jersey that, you know, if the next couple of games are back to normal, then that one was just sort of the outlier and you kind of look at it as just one of those games that happens sometimes during a season. You don't play as well every once in a while. Um, they were able to come back, and they still got a point out of a game. They probably didn't deserve a point, but – when you go back and look at kind of the Nashville game, which was a really not choppy. What's the word I'm looking for here? It was a very feisty game. Mm-hmm. It was very much like Nashville was very angry about something. Was that the first game back after the pause? Uh, yes. So I maybe they were just kind of chippy. They had missed a week. They uh, wanted to get back on the ice. Well, I wonder if part of it's just kind of their style of play. They like to get on, you know, they're physical. They like to get under your skin a little bit. And that's what they kept talking about in the broadcast. The Caps, uh, Ben and I lock when we're talking about how that's kind of the Nashville style in terms of how they want to play. And that's, that's fine. It was just kind of weird. I even had, you know, a friend of mine text me and be like, do they have a rivalry? And I was like, no, <laughs> not really sure what's going on. Like they're just both Nashville. And I, I do think it was Nashville more so than the Caps, at least at first, where they were be kind of mad at each other and being a little chippy. And, that, that was a lot of let's old team, credit. right? Yeah, and I don't, I don't think that necessarily had anything to do with it. No, um, that's that's interesting though that our last two coaches, uh, or actually, I thought about two that of, during the two game. of three came from Nashville. I did think about that during the game where at one point I was like, "Huh, there's an interesting little connection here." And their GM used to be the general manager of the Caps long, long time ago now. But I, I just thought it was weird. I don't think there's any sort of rivalry developing between Nashville and Washington because. They don't play each other enough for that to be the case. Right. I think that was just sort of Nashville style, and Caps were beating up on them offensively, and they didn't like that. And you know what? If you don't like it, play better. And then you have the game against Detroit, which was – Caps just played a good game. They came out with a win. Actually, going back to Nashville real quick, did you see at the end of the game Carlson waving goodbye to them? I did, yeah. So I there's, def- that there's some chippiness Not nice. there. Not nice, but funny. And I think that they have a hard time beating Nashville in Nashville's own barn. Yeah, it was like the first time in, I don't know, eight years or something. 
Yeah, so I mean, maybe there is a little bit of chippiness there that we don't really notice since we don't play them very often, but maybe there's something there that they're just not, these two teams just don't like each other, which, I mean, use it more fuel to the fire, but there's, yeah, there's definitely something going on there. Um, But we should say this, with the return of these three games, we also saw the return of the Taxi Squad, and we got to see some new faces. Some people actually did go back down to Hershey, but we saw a very familiar face, Michael Kepney, back on the ice in the NHL. What did you think of him? He's been playing the last couple games with a couple players still out with COVID. Uh, it looks like the time down in Hershey has kind of done him done him well. Well, he hadn't played in so long that he definitely needed the opportunity to get some games under him and get his sort of feedback. Right. And, I, you know, I think he's looked fine. I don't think he's tried to do too much necessarily. I think he's just tried to stay within his game. I get his, keep his feet under him as he's playing, and I think he's done fine. I think defensively, with the exception of the New Jersey game, that this team has done well um, with everything that's going on. I mean, look at the standings right now. They're first in the East, and within the league, they're actually on top of the league points-wise. Now, they are one point up on Carolina, who's played three less games than them. So Carolina wins one of those three games, and they're back on top. But... I still think that the Caps are playing exceptionally well, especially for a team. And every team's having to go through injuries and COVID-related you know, reasons as to why someone is missing uh, or some ones are missing from a game, those being players or even coaches. But I think that the Capitals have done exceptionally well filling in the gaps. And I think a lot of credit has to go to Hershey and their coaching staff and the players that have been coming up from Hershey and playing well. And when you have a guy like a Michael Kempney who can come up as a veteran and slide back into his spot in the NHL, is a great thing. You know, you're not solely relying on bringing up young guys, even though that has been working. You have an opportunity to bring in a veteran guy. And it's not a, a journeyman NHL or AHL or who you're bringing up just because you don't feel comfortable with any of your young guys and he kind of understands how the game works. Like, this is a guy who's won a cup and was a big contributor towards winning that cup. So to have him available, we'll see what happens in terms of how long he stays up here because a lot of their guys, are Caps guys, are getting at least defensively are coming back from COVID and whether things, other things are going on, but to have him available, I think is a great thing. I, you know, if they have to send him back down, I, my guess is he ends up on the taxi squad, at least until that goes away. Right. And that's like another month and a half. Yeah. And then they'll figure out what they do with him. But he still, now, he still has a hefty price tag attached to him as well. Yeah. But I wonder if a team that is pushing for the playoffs or a team that is rebuilding and has a bunch of young players, I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now, but I wonder if one of those teams will look at him and go, you know what? Why not? Let's take a chance on him. I mean, he's only got, let me bring up cap friendly real quick, but why not take an opportunity to bring him on board? I think he's only, he's in the last year of his deal. I want to say is that advertisement. Get out of here. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Where is Kempney? He is in the last year of his deal. So he's a free agent at the end of the season. So you're not even bringing him in at 2.5, which is his, you know, his contract for this season, his cap hit, I should say he, it's going to be less because we're 30 something games into the season. So if you're a team that's pushing for the playoffs and you want a veteran backup, you might put, you know, do you want to put out a waiver claim on him? It's not going to hurt you too much. And if you're the capitals, I think you're finding a way to keep him around. If he continues to play well, if he's struggling, it's not the end of the world. But if he's playing well, you're looking at going, you know what? I think I think we might actually hang on to this guy for a little while. Yeah, I mean, maybe the time in the AHL has really done him good, improved his game. I mean, he definitely has not looked the same since those past couple injuries, but maybe that time away uh, kind of helped him out and let him shake some rust off and, and regain some focus on that NHL career. Uh, but we'll see. What does it mean for him – once the taxi squad is over in a month and a half, if, you know, COVID stays away and, and we can get back to what we were doing in the fall, uh, if he does go back down to to Hershey or, or well, you're saying keep him around, what do you do with a guy like Martin Fehavari or have some of these defensive players get off the COVID list? Is it possible to carry him as well as the other defensemen you already have? Yeah, because you're not necessarily playing him. You know, it, you're – you have to find a way to get his contract on the books. And because he's, you know, it's not that full. I might have this wrong, but I don't believe, it's not the full cap hit at that point. Okay. Because it's later in the season. I could have that wrong. So one, you have to find a way to keep him on the books. But 
you know, at that point, if you feel like he's going to play better than a Matt Irwin or better than a Chalowski, then you send one of those guys, but one of those guys on waivers, assuming that they're going to clear or hoping that they'll clear. So you have some depth and you send them down and you keep, you keep kept me around because he can step in, especially if he's a healthy scratch, he can step in and play to give someone a night off. Or if someone's got an injury or a, you know, a cold bug or some reason that they're out, you then have him available to go and play. And I don't think they necessarily did that at the beginning of the season because they wanted him playing as many games as possible so that he could get back into game shape and that he could get his feet underneath him and playing, you know, it's an AHL. It's not as fast. It's not as good, obviously, as the NHL, but it gives you an opportunity to have him continue working his way back to, he's probably not going to get to where he was, but to get somewhere, some to get close to that, some semblance of it only helps the caps out in the long run because there are guys, you know, it doesn't affect a Favari. He's still going to be playing, likely pairing back up with Carlson. It's not going to affect um, Van Riemsdyk, likely. You know, you're not going to move one of those guys out. He's likely staying as a healthy scratch if he continues to play well. And you know what? If he's playing better than a Van Riemsdyk, if he's playing better, it's not going to be like Schultz, but if he's playing better than any one of these other guys, then yeah, maybe he does get to play over them. But that's what we want as the cap, uh, as Caps fans. I should say we want the best players playing in and every, you know, every game because that gives them the best opportunity to win. Yeah. You want to be able to play these young guys, but they have to earn that spot. If they're not playing well enough and they haven't earned that spot, then they don't get to play. Now, two guys that made their NHL debuts this past week, we have Alex Alexiev, who he's been in the organization with the Capitals for a while now. There's been a spotlight kind of on him. A lot of Caps fans were very uh, excited to have him make his NHL debut. We also have Lucas Johansson, who uh, he uh, made his debut as well. What were your thoughts on these two guys coming in from the Hershey system, making their debut of, what is this, I believe the 50th uh, rookie to make their debut for the Caps this year? Uh, 52nd, 52nd. All right. Just make the Mike green of the, no, I, uh, I, what was it? Um, Alan may was saying it was like the 10th or 11th, but then I think it was the eighth person to make their NHL debut for the team this season. Uh, I thought both looked good. I think they're, you know, clearly they had a bit of nerves to get over. And I think they both show that there's some promise there. I thought it was interesting that Johansson wasn't he talking or is it Johansson? Johansson, however you say his last name. He's one of those ones that's always kind of could be either or. Wasn't he recently saying in the last year or so he wanted to leave the organization because they weren't giving him an opportunity? I can't remember if that was him or not. I'm pretty sure it was him. But, and it's not like a slight him or anything like that. Like, I get that. He he wanted an opportunity. He felt like he wasn't going to get one at the Capitals. And he, he asked, I don't know if he actually asked to be traded. He thought maybe this would be a good thing. Either way, there was noise being made from his camp that he wanted a move so he had a better opportunity to make it in the NHL. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but I thought he played well. I thought Alexia played well. I think they show that there's a, you know even more depth there. I thought it was entertaining that I think it was Alexia played first. He played in the Nashville game? Yes, because so. Johansson played against... Uh, Johansson played against... Um, who did they play? Detroit. Which was I thought was kind of messed up because then the brothers didn't get to play against each other because his brother Ryan plays for Nashville. So right. Laviolette, you could have made a better story for the reporters and everybody else for that Nashville game. But we'll move on from that. I thought they both played well. You know, I thought it was nice to see them both in the NHL. I think that, like, like I said, it's great that they have this depth and they know that they have these players and it gives them an opportunity to showcase these guys because I think Alexia they really are high on and they think that he's going to be he's the next you know potential Favari in terms of or Favari in terms of making the roster at some point next year or so I think Johansson has an opportunity do you you know if there's a team that looks at him and saw what he did and is watching you know been monitoring him in the AHL are they going you know what maybe we'll take a shot on him and you can get another prospect or you can get a, a, a draft pick or include him in a deal for a top six winger or center if you need one because Backstrom can't seem to be able to play in back-to-back games at this point because he's either getting injured, COVID, or an illness. And do you need some depth? Do you move him with someone else to bring in a depth player that improves your NHL roster? And Hershey might be like, well, come on. We need the help too. But that's the reality of being a minor league team that has an affiliation with an NHL team. You're going to lose prospects at some point because these prospects are, are key components towards trades that can improve your roster 
in the immediate future for a run at the Stanley Cup. So I like what I saw from them. I don't think they're necessarily a big key component for this knock on wood that we don't have a ton of injuries or whatever. So they have to come back up, but or continue playing. But it was nice to see them out there. Yeah, you gotta you gotta feel for not just the Bears and the Stingrays, but you gotta feel for every AHL team and every ECHL team right now because yes, these prospects are are the I don't want to say the property of the NHL. They're the, they're the they're the prospects of the NHL team. It's everybody's ultimate goal to make it to that high level to the NHL. Uh, but you got to feel for these teams because they're like, uh, we need to play too. We've got schedules to like, that we. Hello. Yeah. We also so, want to play. So I, I remember. I think it was the ECHL. They were they did that graphic like the Bears did for the the Caps where it was like they put a little Hershey Bear or they did their Stingray logo in the Hershey Bears colors because there were so many Stingrays that had been brought up to the AHL. But you have to feel for them. They they're put, getting a strain as well because they've still got games to play and now they need to get these these random players on on tryout contracts just to fill some of their lineups. It's crazy. Yeah, and I think. I think you're, I mean you're seeing that probably throughout the NHL, the AHL, the ECHL. You're probably seeing that in every sports league as well around the world. I don't I don't know if there's like farm uh, systems you know, no, like yeah. the NHL has. You know I know there's not one for like the NFL, but like if you look at the they the should Ravens, have that though. Oh, hundred percent they should. Yeah, I've been talking about that for years. Don't have practice squads. Like have, they have practice squads, but they should. There should be. I wonder how much they should have with injuries wise, but like having minor league NFL. You know, it, it I give. This is a hockey podcast, but whatever. It gives the opportunity for other cities to have teams. Yep. Like you could have, you have the staying local. You have the Washington football team. You guys, you have the Ravens. You could have a my. What's the? You could have. I don't know. Ravens could have a minor league team in Annapolis. Right. You know, Washington would probably have one in Richmond. I mean, there's so many of them in baseball. I mean, you've got. Bowie and Aberdeen and uh, Delmarva and uh, Norfolk and then the Nationals they had what at Harrisburg I think the Harrisburg had so they have the Her- yeah Harrisburg Senators they've got the they Frederick the Keys are their are their own thing now yeah so Major League Baseball reduced the amount of minor league teams or minor league teams you're allowed to have yeah that was kind of a, a uh, I'm not gonna say what kind of move it was because this is a, it's a family show but. Uh, <laughs> But they had um, they had to reduce teams, and so that ended up with the the keys. Though it's nice. I mean, they don't have as many games anymore, but they're like a a rookie league or something team now. It's it's players that are are eligible to go to the next draft. Okay. Okay. Cool. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my girlfriend and I went there to meet uh, Kevin from the office over the summer. <laughs> it's a nice little stadium they have in Frederick. It really is. Nice. I, I mean, I haven't been. Able, I actually drove past it <clears throat> recently. Uh, my brother lives up in Frederick or near Frederick. And so we were up there dropping something off for him. And then we drove past the stadium as we were like taking our long way out. <laughs> and, and it is, I mean, it is a, it's a very nice stadium. It's right, you know, by kind of near one of the highways or, or, or major roads there. It's cool. Uh, the Nats. So their AAA is in Rochester, double A's in Harrisburg. I feel like years ago, the Orioles really wanted Harrisburg, but I think it'd be cool if the Nats, I feel like the Nats and the Orioles should trade Bowie and Harrisburg, but, that's just me. Harrisburg's, a, I mean, that's a hike for me. I almost went to a Harrisburg game a couple years ago because they were up against the Mets farm team, and I wanted to see Tim Tebow play. <laughs> I came really close to going because I had off that day. Maybe because the Orioles were here first, so they're just claiming all of the uh, all the different uh, teams that they can. I mean, can. probably, but if you're the Orioles, aren't you trying to find a way to get Harrisburg? You can kind of get up in sort of the Phillies territory a little bit. Yeah, give Washington Norfolk. We don't need them. I agree with that. I'll, I mean, that makes sense. Similar to the Norfolk Admirals being the ECHL affiliate of the Caps, because you kind of have that, you have that area now between Norfolk and, and Hershey that you kind of would have start to bring in fans. Yeah. Or Baltimore. Yeah, I'm still down been, for that. Yeah, we've been talking about that for for nine years. I don't think it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening. I just need to make a couple billion dollars, and then I can just do it myself. Hey, I did get Powerball tickets, so. You know, you will actually be the coach. I promise you. If I win and buy an ECHL I, team, okay. So I'm not actually a hockey coach. That's going to be the fun part. Let's just see how he does. But no, okay, no. <laughs> but I will be more than happy when you own the team to have some sort of role with the organization. 
Um, or just, oh, dude, let me do like play by player, not play by player. I wouldn't be good at that. Now I'm going to hire Ryan for that. Yo, dude, do that. Bring him down. Then we can hang out with Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to have to leave Canada though. Poor guy. No, it's cool. He'll just bring a lifetime supply of like Tim Hortons or something. We'll be all right. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, I'll I'll buy a Tim Hortons and bring it here. Exclusive there you go. to the arena. Boom. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Let's keep working on this. That's how I lore calls. him. Be all right, like, so what are we calling the team, owner Brandon? The Baltimore hockey team. Well, oh. I mean, we could do the Baltimore Bullets. That makes a lot of sense here. They're not um, gonna do that. No, no. No, no it's gonna be and violent. It's going to be something with the Navy because we're so close to Annapolis. Skip it's going to do checks. something with Fort McHenry. It's uh, yes. there. Yeah. Clippers. The Clippers. The I like Skip that. Jacks. Do you think I'll, um, I'll settle for the, the Bandits? Clippers that's who I. That's who I worked with or uh, watched growing up is the uh, Baltimore Bandits for the two seasons they were here. That doesn't even make sense though. It's just two Bs. That's all that people want. That's stupid. No, oh, man. Yeah. I like Clippers. Cl- Skip Jacks, which I know it's a. a water based thing but i don't really it's get a, it it's a boat all right sure i like clippers though i mean you might have the la clippers being like excuse me <laughs> no but you know i i like i think baltimore clippers would be cool all right what's my job with the team uh you're gonna be the guy that cleans up the place after everyone leaves all right that's rude <laughs> That was that was rude. Come on, you left yourself me... open for that one. I did, but you could have been nice. <laughs> Give me a real job, man. Come Let's on. see. I'll have you work with Ryan. He'll be the play-by-play, and you'll be like the stats guy. So you all like... do the commentating. We'll just hang out and make jokes. Yeah, so time. it'll be great. He'll, he'll do the play-by-play, and then you can be like that player has won the last five out of six face-offs. <laughs> just slip him notes. That's cool. The problem would be the Caps don't have any players in the ECHL. So and, and what I'll do like, is I'll just mess with you and I'll give you false information. Just be like, this guy. I would just hurt you in the long run as the owner of the team. No, people would tune in to see like what I get you to say. It'd be like, this guy, you know, I'm didn't the like the Lachlan. last Tomb Raider movie. Why would why would you give me that note? <laughs> Conveniently, that one will get lost in my stack of notes. <laughs> just give me uh, a, one. I get a box and I'll be good. Oh, the, let's do a box where like you just put your hand in, you don't know which one you're pulling out, and it's just like, all right, let's see what we got here. Perfect. Sure. Keep you on your toes. It'll be like Survivor. That's what we'll do. You can be the host of our ECHL Survivor, and whoever gets voted off the team after each game, somebody gets voted off the team, or they have to work their way back. So I'm the in-house entertainment? Yes. 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 I don't know if I'm the right guy for that, but we'll see how it works. We'll set you up with a YouTube video. You can do post-game and pre-game and all that good stuff. But let's talk a little bit more about the Capitals and not go into a fantasy world where I'm a billionaire. Actually, no, I want to live in that world where I'm a millionaire and I own a hockey team. Anyway, let's talk about uh, a guy who got sent back to the minors. Uh, We have Protus. He actually went back to Hershey. I was a little surprised by this move because he has been with the Capitals for, I mean, pretty much his entire career, but he's been playing on the Capitals uh, NHL level for over 20 games. But now with, you know, Michael Kempney playing and his contract being there and Backstrom back, the Caps had to make some moves. And unfortunately, Protus got sent back down, which I was a little bummed to see. I've been impressed with his work this season. Yeah, I think what he's done has actually been really good. Because he was he was the top line guy when Wilson was hurt, right? I mean, yeah, he was playing on there with Kuznetsov and Ovechkin, and some of that stuff is gonna, you know, he's not gonna be as good, obviously. But you get an opportunity like that. I think he took advantage of it as best he could, and I think it shows that he's definitely one for the future. But I think with a lot of players starting to come back, especially everybody that came off COVID protocol, they had to send some people down. I don't think you want him necessarily on the taxi squad because you want him playing. And so he goes back to Hershey where he has an opportunity to play in every game, and I'm sure they like having him back. And I think that it makes the most sense to do it. And I think this is a guy, you know, for the future, and that future could be next season depending on how things go. Do you know uh, his contract status, like how long he's he, his contract's going? He's got two more years after this season. He's only 20. I mean, this you know, he's, this is a young oh, guy. Oh, wow. I did not know he was that young. Yeah, well, he is only 20. because he's 17 feet tall. <laughs> so he looks much older because he's actually a giant. But he's a player that I think this team is very high on right now, and I think we likely are going to see him in the NHL 
potentially later on this season or, or full time next season, provided everything can you know continues to go well in Hershey. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, I did not realize he was that young and his first season with the Capitals was 2019, 2020. I thought he's been with the Capitals for a couple of years now. Wow. He definitely has made an impact. He's a, uh... yeah, he's actually 45, <laughs> but yeah, that's interesting. Okay, cool. Good for him. Yeah. He's definitely got some time to develop in Hershey. He doesn't need, need to be up here full time, but he's definitely impressed and he's a guy to keep an eye on. Absolutely. So, but what we do know is that the Capitals suck at overtime. They continually go to it to get that one point, and then they just can't put games away. The Caps were up against the Devils, got the game to go to OT. The Devils were down to, what, four defensemen in that game? So many uh, of their defensemen got hurt. Former Capital Jonas Singenthaler played the game, and then he took a puck to the face late in the game, so he was out for a couple shifts. You know, so- I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often in games. That like guys ran- just get taken out? No, <laughs> no, it's not Call of Duty, but I'm thinking more along the lines of like, it's, I don't know, it's a credit to, to, again, I don't know, it's a credit to hockey players in terms of their strength because so many injuries happen throughout games, like things like that, where you take a puck to the face, yeah. and he's like, hold on, let me go in the back and just get it cleaned up, and then I'll come back. Like, he came back out and played. Yeah. He took a hockey puck to the face. <laughs> and then he came back and played and he was, you know, he's fine. Probably. I don't know. So, you know, just credit to hockey players for that. Now, what do you think the caps have to do here to finish in regulation or to finish in overtime? It just seems like these guys are getting, we saw this against the Bruins in the playoffs. It seems like these guys just get tired at the end of a game and they can't finish teams. What, what do the caps have to do to, to get these two points out of a game and to put teams away. Okay. So here's something I literally just thought of while you were asking that question. Perfect. The caps right now, this season have been terrible at two things. One winning in overtime, right? They are what one in nine. If you include shootouts, right? The second thing that they suck at, at least recently is the power play, right? That's been years though. (laughs) <laughs> that's not true power play <laughs> where you have you know five on four and they're ter- oh, five on three four on three and they're not good at it. i wonder if there is a connection between the power play and them being bad in overtime like is having more ice which makes no freaking sense to me but is having more ice an issue like i don't think that it's a, a matter of them just being tired you know like the the coaching staff's responsibility is to manage ice time for everybody and they're professionals. I mean, they were exercised for a living, so that shouldn't be the case. And they had all of this time off, not all of this, they had some time off before they came back and, you know, had these three games. So that I, that's not an excuse for me. I just wonder if there's an action between their terrible power play and their issues with overtime where they can't win. Like they almost don't know how to put themselves in a good spot or they're just completely snake bit, but it's so weird that they're Owen seven in overtime. Yeah. Like I'd love to see a statistic in terms of teams, longest droughts, not winning in overtime and see like, is this the longest anyone's gone without having won in overtime, both into a season or just in general? Yeah. I, I don't know. This is, I, I feel like they, they, they work so hard in regulation just to get to overtime. Like they, they are playing from behind for so long. It's just kind of like, all right, let's just get the one point. Let's just get to overtime and worry about overtime later. But I, I, I really don't know. It, it's, it's not like they don't have secondary scoring. We've talked immensely about how the secondary scoring is, is so much better this year and that it is four lines uh, contributing. So I, I, I honestly, I do not know what the issue is, but every time this team goes to overtime, I get a little worried because I'm like, I don't see this going their way. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's so weird. And when you look at this team, if you look at the team on paper, you look at this roster and you go, uh-huh. 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 Okay. Oh yeah. No, I just, the top six guys in terms of what they're earning is enough to win in overtime. Like you don't even have to put in a defenseman. You're going, yeah, that should be more than enough to win an OT. But for whatever reason, 
like the setup and i i don't even know how much you can like set up a play in overtime like you can to an extent but it's so free flowing and so different than a normal five on five or even four on four right that i have to imagine that there's almost an aspect of creativity from the players themselves that is required to win in overtime so I don't know. I'm just glad that you know, if this, assuming the team makes the playoffs, that three on three overtime isn't going to happen. Yeah, if they can get to the postseason where they actually just continue continue to play, that might actually work out in the Caps' favor. I mean, yeah, I guess it would just you know, win in overtime also would be. I mean, think about it. how many games if they won half those games in overtime, that's an extra, let's say, four points. Right there, which puts you in a better spot. If they won one of those other shootouts, that's another one. So now you got five points. Well, and it's also, like you said, the Caps are at the top of the NHL and in the East Division right now, or whatever their division is right now. Uh, but a lot of these teams have games that have been postponed. So, like, at the end of the season, you could have a team like the Pittsburgh Penguins or the Hurricanes or some other team that – Caps are done their season, and then they still have three to four games to play later on down the road, and they can stack up those points, and the Caps can do nothing about it, and they can fall in the standings without even playing a game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why every point matters. You know, look at the Islanders. They played, I think, six less games than the Caps right now. Yeah, now they're like yeah. 20-something points behind them, so that doesn't it's not something you have to worry about necessarily, but... It's a weird season, and so you really just need every point you can get. And this is a tough division. So Very tough. To, to win this division, you're going to have to get as many points as you can. And when you keep losing points by blowing it in overtime, it's going to cost you. And then there's the power play, which I have no idea how to fix at this point. Like, you just have to... to I mean, like, they're one for 53,000 over their past however many like it's insane this i can't remember what the statistic is but their power play is so terrible right now and with the players on this team there's no excuse for it and they they need to either blame i think blame fourth the guy in charge of it he needs to mix it up and try something different which i don't think they're doing it or they're not doing enough of or he needs to go and i feel bad about that because he's a human being and saying he needs to lose his job is not cool though i'm sure he'll get another job pretty quickly in the hockey world but his job is to make sure that the power play works and it's not working. And the only reason that I can think of that they haven't gotten rid of him at this point is because they can't think of anyone that can do the job better right now. Yeah. And that's scary because it's not working. So there's gotta be someone that's like, Hey, um, I have an idea. Like maybe we should do it like Ted Lasso and bring in the equipment manager to come in and suddenly, oh, this guy's great. He could be a great coach. And then he turns out to be more like Jose Mourinho and goes to West Ham, which is not entirely my joke. It's someone else's joke. That's besides the point. Um, so I think something's got to change because, and we're going to say this every week, it seems like, because their power play is pathetic. Like, at this point, the other team takes a penalty. And I'm like, all right, so it gives them an opportunity to score. Yep, but it's not the Cavs. They, they have a chance for a shorty. Right. Like, the next game, when is the next game? Uh, Friday. I might fall. Wow, that's a break. Right? I'm, oh, because the Montreal game got postponed. That's why it's long. Well, no. Uh, well, I finish your point, I'll, and I'll bring up my next point about the break. But go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just saying, like, the next time they score a power play goal, I might actually fall out of my chair. <laughs> because I will be so shocked. So, all right. So, look at this. Look at the next two weeks. Jumping, jumping ahead here. So, we have a four-day break after they had just gotten done with a pause of a week where they're going to play back-to-back games against the St. Louis Blues. that one wasn't intentional. Sure, yeah, but, I mean, it does get the players and, and everybody else out of their rhythm. But you're up against the Winter Classic teams. You're up against the Blues and then the Wild uh, this this Those weekend, back-to-back. Back. terrible. Which ones? The Wild ones. I didn't mind them. I thought they were all right. They were interesting. Yeah, you would like them. Yeah, I mean, it's just because they were so weird. I, I was kind of like, ah, oh, I kind of dig it. Uh, so look at that. So you have a four-day break there and then a back-to-back game. We're going to see uh, Aussie Nathan Walker probably on Friday. He played in the Winter Classic. Good for him. Then you have a game on Monday against Boston, who technically, if the playoffs started today, that's who the opponent would be for the Capitals. Then after Boston, 
you have Tuesday through Friday off, another four day break. And then you travel up to Long Island to go up against the Islanders. And then after that, look at the next two weeks, and it's a game every other day. It's a weird so, schedule. So this is going to be a, I don't want to say it's a tough January because you've got those two four-day breaks in there, but it's definitely going to be difficult for the Caps to, to get a rhythm here up until January 15th. Because after that, you've got a back-to-back that weekend, uh, Islanders, Vancouver, and then it's every other every other day for the next two weeks. Let me let me look into February, and then we don't know what's going to happen because of the Olympic break. But yeah, they're going to have some games. They're going to get made up during that. Yeah, but you're looking at the schedule, and it's put your feet up, enjoy yourself for a couple days, and then boom, 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 you're you're traveling you're going every other day and who knows what happens with with uh the post holiday spike of the coronavirus how that's going to affect things but yes this is a good time to allow players to heal these next 2 weeks but after that you're looking forward to end of January February March you you've got a a very packed schedule i mean look at March god look there are every week in March has a back to back game like this is this is gonna be a this is a rough schedule, and I know they had to do this because of the Olympics and they're trying to plan things around COVID and all that kind of stuff. But after these two weeks, I mean, it is full on hockey season. <laughs> like, if you're a hockey player, you're gonna be like, God, I'm tired by the end of this. I mean, the benefit to having all these games is that the players can get into a rhythm. Yeah, and yeah, but they're that... not gonna get into that rhythm for another two weeks, though. Yeah. But that gives them into a rhythm. It gives the team an opportunity to see what they've got before the trade deadline. And it gives you an opportunity to kind of showcase some of these younger players you know, as they rotate you know, people in and out of the taxi squad. It gives you an opportunity to, to showcase them in case you want to make a move to bring in some depth or some, some scoring or defensive work for, for the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens. But very, very odd schedule this year and – just kind of goes along with the last two years we've had. Everything's just really odd. So uh, anything else we should talk about in Caps World? Uh, let's see. Did you see, I, real quick, did you see that story on the Washington Post about TJ Yoshi? I did not. So basically, it's you know it's not a major com- topic of conversation. I just thought it was interesting. So Oshi uh, has become friends with like a bunch of dads <laughs> at his kids uh, from, his, from his oldest ones. I think it was his oldest ones. Uh, daycare. Okay. Which I just thought was funny. Like he was there and he was just like talking with some other dads and they're like, Oh, what do you, they're talking about like what they do for a living. He's like, Oh, I play hockey. And I was like, Oh, like as a hobby, like, that's cool. Like, where do you get to play? And Oshie's she's like, no, I play for the Washington capitals. How do they not know that? And I, they don't follow hockey. Come on. And so, but it was fine. Cause apparently like they've gone to games and stuff. And like one dude was saying he went to a game and Oshie played and he was like, wait, you're like a good player. Like we thought you were one of like the extra people that, you know, you get to like practice with them and stuff. You don't actually play, but you're actually like good. <laughs> I was like, how, like, I have a kid now, and I just think it'd be funny if, like, one day I'm, like, going to drop him off at school with the kids in his class. Like, his dad is, like, Nick Backstrom. I mean, they all live in Virginia, but it would be cool. I'd be like, hey. I guess the only other thing we got to bring up in Caps World is we got to say congrats to Alexander Ovechkin. That's doesn't right. get enough Doesn't get enough acc- accolades, if you ask me. He's pretty he's, good. Yeah. Most power play goals in NHL history with 275, and he's still got a couple more years to play. So he's going to be adding on some of those uh, totals, I'm sure. Keep that record on for a little bit. Yeah, I, I that might be one that's going to take a long time for someone to, although McDavid, you never know. But that might be one that for a long time won't be broken. And then he's 12 away from Yager now. Yeah, he's getting closer. So that could be in this with the way he scores, that could be this month or early next month. Yeah. I love Backstrom's quote about Ovi and the power play goals. He's just like, what can I say? He just, he likes scoring goals. <laughs> he likes scoring goals. He likes when other people score goals. My favorite picture, I think, of all time with him, aside from him hoisting the cup, yeah. is when they scored in the playoffs against the Flyers. The first year the Caps made it to the playoffs. Boudreaux's first year. And... It was Mike Green scored and he went to go celebrate, like jump into Green's arms or whatever. And right. after the game, Green was talking about, he's like, I was just trying to get away from Ovi. Because he <laughs> thought he was going to get like trucked by him because he was so excited. 
that's always i don't know i've always remembered that i can i can remember the photo very well all right well is that it for caps world i think yeah i think that's it man all right well hey uh we'll finish up caps world here now let's go down on the farm All right, everybody, here we go. We're going down on the farm. We are talking Hershey Bears, even though I feel like we've already done this, and South Carolina Stingrays. Coach Dan, what's going on down on the farm? Yeah, we kind of have already talked about, like, Hershey and South Carolina a bunch, but it was more like the association and not the actual teams. Right. But let's do what we normally do. Let's start in Hershey with the Bears, who went 2-0 and with wins over Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, and Bridgeport in the past week. They right. are currently second in the Atlantic Division with 33 points, four back of first place Springfield. They'll be back at it on Wednesday, hosting Lehigh Valley at the Giant Center before heading to Syracuse on Friday, then back-to-back home games on Saturday and Sunday against Wilkes-Barre Scranton. Now, while the Bears are doing well, South Carolina is still struggling as the Stingrays finally broke their losing streak with a one nothing win over Jacksonville on New Year's Day. All right. But over the past week, they went 1-2-1 two, and one with losses to Jacksonville and an overtime loss to Orlando. So even when they're winning, they're still struggling. Aww. They are still currently last, so they're tied, but they're last point-wise in the South Division with 23 points, 17 back of first place Jacksonville. Although they're only six points out of fourth. So there's a chance if they can actually start winning some games. So they'll, you're telling me there's a chance. There's a chance. They'll try and turn things around with back-to-back games in Florida on Friday and Saturday before heading to Orlando on Monday. That's what's going on down on the farm. All right, well, that's it for uh, down on the farm. Go Bears! Go Stingrays! Now let's go around the NHL and beyond! Everybody, here we go. We're going around the NHL and beyond. There's plenty of stuff going on. The Winter Classic happened, and it was, uh, was it negative eight degrees by the time the puck hit the ice? These guys were cold, but they did show up in uh, in uh, luau shirts and Hawaiian shirts and looked like they were dressed for the beach. That's the way that I was actually really well. funny. That was really funny. It's too bad the I game the fact- was a bit of a blowout, but that was actually really entertaining. I love the fact that they were like, well, we bought these Lumberjack shirts, and uh, then we decided against them. So if anybody needs a large or an extra large, I've got about 32 Lumberjack shirts. <laughs> we got a couple left over. Yeah. Well, hey, Coach Dan, tell us, what's going on around the NHL and beyond? Well, it's funny you should be talking about the Winter Classic, as Minnesota recently signed their current head coach and former Caps assistant coach, Dean Evison and his entire coaching staff to multi-year extension. So congrats to them. Former Hershey head coach and Caps assistant coach Bob Woods is actually on his coaching staff. I don't know if you remember that name. Hmm. Florida Sam Bennett received a three-game suspension for an illegal check to the head on Montreal's Cedric Paquette. That's not very nice. Don't do it. Yeah, don't do that. That's rude. And so he gets to sit out for three games. Let's shift over to Vancouver, where there's an amazing story that's actually come out. And it's not about Boudreaux's amazing start to his tenure with the Canucks as their head coach, even though he's doing very well over there. Bruce, there it is. So back in... <laughs> he still hates it. I know. You caught me off guard with that one. Uh, so back in October, Vancouver was playing in Seattle in what I believe was their home opener and their first ever home game. There was a woman sitting behind the bench by the name of Nadia, and I apologize if I pronounced her last name incorrectly, but her name is Nadia Popovici. She was sitting behind the Canucks bench, and she happened to see the back of the neck of the assistant equipment manager, Brian, nicknamed Red Hamilton. She saw a mole on the back of his neck that looked cancerous and wrote him a note on her cell phone. So she started banging on the glass. And as you can imagine, this guy's been in the league for 20 years. I think he's worked with the Canucks the entire time. He's used to people banging on the glass around the benches. Right. But at some point, she actually got his attention. He turned around and she held the note on her phone up to the glass. And the note said, the mole on the back of your neck is cancer. Now, that, given that, that's terrifying. So like, but part of me thinks if I'm in that position, I, I've been working with it in the NHL for years. I'm always on the well, not always half the games. I'm in the visiting team's bench. And duh. And so 
I'm probably getting like, you know, nonsense talk to me or people banging on glass all the time. And you learn to ignore it, especially if you've been doing it as long as, as he has. But he took it serious. I mean, he kind of was like, oh, okay, thanks. And then like kept doing his job. But at some point he actually was like, hmm, maybe I should get this checked out. Turns out it was a malignant melanoma in phase two. So it was cancer. Oh my God. He got it removed and he's doing okay. This woman good. literally saved this dude's life. They're saying if he let it go for a couple, he didn't even know like there was a mole there. If he let it go for a couple more years, he's in trouble. So here, here's my thing. I, I, again, we have been over this a plethora of times on this show. Neither Coach Dan nor I are doctors. What was what does a cancerous mole look like? Like what did she see that made her go? Mm, that's probably cancer. Uh it was. So I actually did a little research after I saw this story because I was curious. Yeah. And there's certain shapes and and ways that they can look that show you that something's going on there. Wow. So it turns out that she's actually uh, got into a couple medical schools. And so she has some background in this and saw it was like, I think there's an article that said like a, a quote in the article that I read that said that is like a textbook example of cancer or cancer. So she saw it and I mean, it's crazy. He got it removed. He's doing okay. Turns out Vancouver posted it on their Twitter account on new year's day and the information quickly was spread like everywhere. Right. And it got to the ladies of the Kraken Facebook group, which is a great name. And turns out Nadia's mother saw it and realized it was her daughter who wrote the note on her cell phone. So I guess they got the two of them together because they met before the two teams played this past Saturday. Oh, About wow. 90 minutes before the game, they actually got to meet uh, and had a moment where they got to chat and kind of she saw from like his perspective where he was like, okay, this person's yelling at me. And then like that kind of note. And he was like, is she talking smack? He actually right. went to like the team doctor and had him look at it. And he was like, you know, I'll mess around with that kind of thing. If you, you know, if you want to remove it, let's remove it. And so, yeah, he got removed. He's doing great. It's crazy. So they met before the game, about 90 minutes before the game. She was recognized during the first period, during a stoppage in play. And both the Kraken and the Canucks are giving her a joint $10,000 scholarship to help wow. her with her medical school expenses. Wow. Good for her. That's this amazing. Is a, yeah, this is a great story. And, you know, people banging on the glass aren't always trying to be annoying. Like, sometimes they're trying to save your life. So, I bet you he was probably like, at the when it first happened and read her note, he was probably like, that's the oddest smack talk I've ever heard. Why would someone say that? Like, that's weird. But now, I mean, you know, for all the, the not great things that we hear about in the world today, there are, I believe there are more good people out there than bad. Yeah, it's just the, the, the just bad people are evidence. just noisier. That's, tr- that's true. Yeah. So, you know, that's amazing. And, and credit to her for speaking up. And, you know, the worst thing that could happen is that he went and got it looked at. And I was like, oh, no, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. You know, she yeah. took a chance and. And, you know, did a really great thing. So let's shift gears over to the IIHF and some news coming out of there as they were actually forced to cancel the 2022 World Junior Championship after only three days of play. A U.S. game, uh, sorry, uh, players on the U.S. team ended up testing positive in a 24-hour period. They had a complete COVID outbreak. Things going on amongst a number of other teams. And they're like, you know what? We're shutting this thing down. This is for the second straight year the tournament was in Alberta. But unlike in 2021, they actually weren't setting up bubbles. And so they just ran hotels like you and I would be with other Mm -hmm. people around. Apparently, one of these hotels had a wedding going on. And so it was better opportunities for people to get this virus. Omicron is highly infectious. And they had to shut down, which was unfortunate. But it seemed like it was the right thing to do. I know a lot of teams were expressing frustration to tournament organizers about there being a lack of bubble environment, which they probably should have done. But, you know, it, it's what happened. It turns out, you know, it sounds like all the players are okay. But it's unfortunate that they had to cancel the tournament. And then did you hear about what happened with the Russian team? No. So they were supposed to be flying home. I forget where they were flying out of. But there was a woman that was tweeting because she was on her way to Frankfurt. I'm guessing there was a layover in Frankfurt. And the Russian junior team got kicked off their flight because they weren't wearing their masks. They were in the back of the plane smoking. Like they're they refusing to wear a mask. Like they're just being completely rowdy, and they got kicked off the plane. I, I it's twenty twenty two at this point, and we're smoking on planes still. 
I don't tell you, man. That's what happened. So oh, that's what I read happened. You know, maybe it was a big misunderstanding, but I don't know. We'll see. The IIHF also announced that they are canceling all of its January events because of the rise in COVID cases. They announced this this past Friday. Now, the cancellations include the 2022 U18 Women's World Championships in Sweden, which is the second straight year that they will not have the stage tournament. Now, obviously, this news upset many players who believe that the pandemic has widened the gender gap in the sport and that the IIHF routinely prioritizes men's programming over women's. Yeah, so this was... This was prior to the cancellation of the um, the World Juniors. So a lot of people were getting very upset that the IIHF has canceled the U18 Women's World Championship uh, again for a second year, which people should be very upset 100%. But they were like, how come the men's are, the men's are having a tournament when the women aren't? Which I, I understand that is wrong, but at the time, I thought they were in a bubble this year and that the, the uh, tournament had already started. It wasn't like they were going to cancel it mid tournament. They actually did uh, cancel it mid tournament, but that's why I'm like, that's why they're not canceling this one right now because it's already happening. Everyone's already there as well. These January tournaments, they're happening all over the world. So the women's was supposed to be in Sweden. I think the U 20 or U 18 men's was supposed to be in Germany And no one had left their home country yet. So I'm like, yeah, that's fine that they're canceling these tournaments with the rise of the cases of everything going on. But a lot of people were very upset about them canceling the Women's World Championship again uh, in January. My hope is that three the three tournaments that were canceled in January, they just reschedule them down the road. But they didn't reschedule the U18 Women's World Championship last year. I doubt they'll do it this year as well, but there was a lot of concern that because you canceled that but kept the men's World Juniors going that they were not being fair gender-wise of who gets to play and who doesn't. So I, I understand the frustration, but we're living in COVID times. You know, it's COVID kind of decides what happens at this point, which is which sucks. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that suck about COVID. And you know what? I think they might have a point in terms of the the gender gap because we've been seeing a lot of stuff where the women's aren't prioritized as much as the men or there's no equal footing here and it's it's not right. Right, right. I agree. You know, COVID's messed up a lot of things, but I think there's a way to do this right where it doesn't look like one's being favorited over the other. Right. But unfortunately, that's what we have. It's fortunately what they have to deal with and they shouldn't have to. Yeah. Uh, Last bit of news, as USA Hockey announced the final roster for its 2022 U.S. Olympic women's ice hockey team that will compete in February at the Winter Games in Beijing. The U.S. heads to China as a defending gold medalist after having defeated Canada. That's right, Ryan! Yeah! (laughs) 32 in a shootout during the gold medal game in 2018. Now, of the 15 players on the roster with Olympic experience... All but Megan Bozek, I apologize to pronounce the names wrong. I'm terrible at names. Megan Bozek and Alex Carpenter were part of the gold medal winning 2018 team. Now, the U.S. opens their competition against Finland in group play on February 3rd. Puck drop is set for 9, 10 p.m. Beijing time and 8, 10 a.m. here on the East Coast. That is interesting. Time-wise, how that works out. Yeah. I love early morning hockey, so I'm going to be... Is this also on NHL Network? This is probably on NBC. Oh, no, this they... is on... Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is yeah. Like, I... I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, that's usually the case. The U.S. Women's or may... Team... Or maybe Peacock. It might be on Peacock. Ooh, I do have that. The U.S. Women's Team was competing against Canada in the My Wai Tour over the last few months. Unfortunately, due to COVID, that tour was cut short with Canada winning four of the six games, which is now when Ryan can tell us verbally but to himself something mean back to us right that yep there you go buddy that's news from the past week in the nhl and beyond so i gotta tell you i am not impressed with the tnt broadcast company or, or broadcast team did for you the NHL. see i meant to write a note about this and i forgot did you see when they came back from an inter? i think it was intermission or break or commercial or something and gretzky and bissonette were not in their seats yet no, I did not that see that. That was so funny to me where they were talking about how the guys were back yet. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so awkward. It's great. 
And Gretzky just comes like sauntering in. And he goes and sits down. And like he's Gretzky. He doesn't care. Right. There's I don't know why I thought. Well, like no one in their production crew. Like I don't know if he was just like taking a leak. I mean, there was a story. Rest in peace, John Madden. But there was a story that just came out where he had the bus, and the only person he ever let take a dump in the bus was Wayne Gretzky. Like I don't <laughs> think if Gretzky's going to take a leak, like some personal assistant who's like 21 years old is like, excuse me, Mister. Like I'm thinking of the guy from The Simpsons with the high pitched voice who has all the acne. Right. Like that dude's gonna go into the bathroom and be like, excuse me, Mister Gretzky, we need to get you back on set. And he's like, kid, I scored a million goals. Get out of here. Like, that's just not happening. So he... Yeah. Bissonette on the other time, like, maybe he was just calling Ryan Whitney about some other, you know, vodka advertisement they want to do. I don't know what he was doing. I, I, I gotta say, I, I I haven't watched a lot of the uh, NHL on TNT content, unless it's the Caps playing. I think they opened up on TNT against the Rangers. But a lot of these guys are the, the guys from NBC Sports. They just brought over. So I thought they'd be a little bit more professional. But I gotta say, I was... Not offended, but I felt really bad for the the U.S. women's ice hockey team because they announced their roster, had them out in negative eight degree weather, waving to the camera, not one lower third to say who we were looking at. Uh, The commentators talked over it the entire time, talking about how we're probably going to see Canada versus the U.S. for the gold medal game. All right, well, hashtag spoilers. Don't why are you giving it's that away? It's not wrestling. It's not scripted. So th- that that's all I of. talked about. Yeah, but, yeah, that we know of. But <laughs> I, I thought that was so incredibly rude. Agreed. Because because on the on the PA at the game, they're they got the guy announcing each person waving. They're up on the jumbotron to show who they are, what position they play. So they had these commentators just talking over these gold medalists. 15, like you said, 15 are returning to this team. These people have gold medals from the last time, just waving to the camera. And then at the end of their little talk in between the two commentators, they go, all right, here's the team and here's the names listed. And then that was it. Show a little respect. You know, this this women's team, they did the My Why Tour. They they are trying to expand the game uh, to, to women's sports, so hockey is a little bit more uh, accepted. And that's who you were going to be watching when the Olympics come in February. Since the NHL pulled out, it's not going to be the best men's hockey, the best players for men's hockey. You're, we're going to be watching the women's games with, with a lot of interest. And you're just kind of like blowing over it like it's like you're filling time on air just kind of like yeah you're given the, the the history of the olympic sport but tell me who these people are why am i invested in this team tell me where they play where they went to college why are they olympians tell me that don't tell me well in the past this is what happened and that would happen and oh yeah here's the roster now part of me wonders if they were adequately prepared i don't know like because it was me- for, it's messed for, up but for no lower seen, thirds as well, they probably yeah, didn't know who was who and when they were waving. Oh, yeah, but so I feel like hockey, hockey and football are the hardest sports to know who, like what a guy normally looks like because you're always wearing a helmet, right? Right. Like you usually know the quarterbacks, and you know if you have a star play, like a star star player, right? Sure. But hockey's kind of the same way. Like I don't, I'll be honest, I don't necessarily know what all the Caps players look like without a helmet on. Especially this year with all the I mean, bears that the are in the lineup. On. Wait, did I say that right? I feel like I messed yeah. that up. No, you're I, good. Doesn't matter. I, I've seen things where like, they're walking in and I'm going, okay. Like in the past, I'm like, yep, that's that person, that's that person. Now I'm like, wait, I don't know if I know who that is exactly. You know? And part of that could be just, you know, more things going on in my life right now. So I don't have the opportunity to necessarily just sit on NHL.com all the time and look what the Caps players look like or go to practices a lot. But no, I mean, it's... Yes, I didn't see what, it, what you were talking about, but when you told me about it, I was like, that's that's embarrassing. I don't know yeah. which is worse, that situation, it's probably that, or when, did you see the ABC when they were doing the ball drop on New Year's Eve, but yes. they were doing it at 11 o'clock for Puerto Rico, and they were making a big deal about how, like, first time they've ever come live from Puerto Rico doing the ball drop for because they're an hour ahead. Right, right. And at 11... It was like three, two, one. Happy new coming up next on the evening news. Yeah. 
And I, I get it because it's automatically programmed to go to your local broadcast at 11. Like, 8 to, to 11 for ABC is primetime television. Right. You have your three hours of programming. And then you go to local news for half an hour, and then they have Kimmel. Or 35 minutes, whatever the case may be. But there's no one at the main ABC studios could have been like, let's delay it by a minute. Right. Or two minutes, right? Like, push the news back five minutes so we can have a whole big thing. Like that was messed up, but this whole thing, like give the women more credit because they're not only because they're winning, but because they deserve it. They've earned it. They're Olympians. Give them the credit they deserve. Give them the opportunities that they deserve. Yeah, I agree. And hopefully come February, uh, everyone in the NHL will know the names and the likeness of everybody playing because I'd like to think that the U.S. will go very far in this uh, Olympic Games. Uh, but it was, I, I was annoyed watching it as a fan, going, like, tell me who I'm looking at, please. That's why I'm, I, I've stayed with you during intermission. You don't need to give me the history of whatever. But hopefully they can do better next time. But Coach Dan, is that the show? Yeah, let's wrap it up, man. All right, guys. Well, if you want to continue the conversation with Coach Dan or I, you can. It's real easy. All you have to do is tweet to either one of us. You can tweet to me at Brando Cash. Coach Dan, where can people tweet to you at? You can find me on Twitter at WTP Coach Dan, talking all kinds of Capitals related stuff when I have an opportunity to just sit there and actually have something interesting to say. Talk about the Caps, Arsenal Football Club, and how they got screwed in their game against Man City, where Arsenal were definitely the better team for a significant portion of that game. Talk on there talking about the Bills. About the New England division, going back to the playoffs. Uh, Washington football team and how not only is that team not very good, but their stadium is an embarrassment. Dan Snyder should be kicked out of the league. Correct. His He has nothing to do with that stadium being necessarily... Hmm. He has something to do with that stadium being a piece of crap. He didn't build it, but he could have done better. It's a terrible stadium. Oh, it's awful. It's so generic and boring. Yeah. And it's falling apart. But yeah, that's finding me on Twitter at WTP Coach Dan. But hey, if you've enjoyed the show, go ahead and check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash what the puck pot. It's where we'll post when new shows are coming out, as well as all sorts of things related to the Washington Capitals, Hershey Bears, South Carolina Stingrays, the Hershey Cubs from time to time, things related to the National Hockey League, and anything else that pops into Brandon's head that he thinks is fun. That's facebook.com slash what the puck pot. But Brandon, I was just talking about football a moment ago. And if someone happens to be a fan of a team based out of Baltimore, is there a podcast they should check out? That's right. If you are a Baltimore Ravens fan, you should listen to my podcast called The Call. Me and my buddy Josh talk all things Baltimore Ravens football. You should probably listen to us now because we probably only got one to two shows left of the season. Because, man, you should just see all the things that have to happen in order for the Ravens to make the playoffs. Uh, Spoiler's not going to happen. So uh, check out my Ravens podcast called The Call. Now, this show we do for free. You listen, stream, and download for free on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Player.fm, Overcast, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Facebook, and YouTube. All we ask in return is for you to please spread the word about the show. Write us an Apple Podcast review. Rate us on Spotify. Subscribe on Facebook. Do all those things so you can listen to us. And then let people know on Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and Pinterest and Instagram and Reddit and Snapchat and Twitch and TikTok. Anywhere you're social on the web or with your phone, say, I'm a Washington Capitals fan. I listen to What the Puck, and you should too. So we got three games to talk about until we talk again. So going all the way to the end of the week, January 7th on Friday. The Caps are on the road in St. Louis up against the Blues. You can watch that game on NBC Sports Washington at 8 o'clock, late night start, 8 o'clock or on the NHL Network. And then on the 8th, back-to-back games in Minnesota, don't you know? That game's at 8 o'clock. You can watch that on NBC Sports Washington. And then on Monday, January 10th, the Capitals come home to D.C. up against the Boston Bruins. That game's at 7 o'clock. You can uh, watch that on NBC Sports Washington. You know, I'm a little surprised. You brought up the Bruins jerseys. You did not bring up uh, the uh, NHL All-Star Game jerseys. Oh, I forgot. They're, I like them. They're, they're kind of simple, but, but not boring. They're classy. I like them. A L- little boring. Yeah, but you like the blue ones for the Caps, so. Which are amazing. <laughs> I stand by that. Should be the primary. 
The, I, you know, I, I, I'm not coming around on them. I don't mind them. I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, at this point, I'm almost like just impartial. Like they're just there. And I wonder if part of my dislike is the fact that the, the old reds are just so nice and they got rid of, not got rid of, but they're not using those or even the reverse retros. They're not using those. Instead, they're using these, these goofy blue ones. It's a little weird that the, uh, reverse retros have, uh, man, those are so nice. Yeah. The reverse retros, they only use them for just a handful of games. I would, I know, right? They made this big hype about it and then they're just gone. I'll never, I don't, I don't know. know if I'll ever understand that one. No, yeah, we'll check it out. Anyway, that's it for the show this week. Kind of a supersized episode. We went a little long on this one, but that's all right. You guys enjoy us, right? We do it for free. That's it for the show this week. Everybody, say it loud, say it proud. Let's go, Caps. This has been a production of Brando Cash Entertainment. Music by DJ Wolfman. Voiceover by Sarah Jacks. For more information, go to brandocash.com.